Well, thanks, thanks for having me. It's been a long time since I've been to a Finch Society of Australia meeting. Uh, the last time was probably in about, I think 1989 was probably the last time I was at a FSA meeting. So it's been a while, I'm trying not to make it so long. Um, my talk tonight is, um, um, it's a fairly, um, it's a fairly wide ranging talk. I'll try not to bore you in some spots, but there's a lot of background that we'll cover. Uh, but it's essentially, it's essentially a story of my life, I guess. So, the palm cockatoo is not ours. I'll just reiterate that. That's uh, Adelaide Zoo. So I've been keeping birds since I was really young, as probably all of us have um, at some point. There are photos of me sitting in my great uncle's canary aviary, me sitting on a milk crate, just sitting there watching the birds. And I, I, still, I still remember that quite well. And um, that was probably the start of the addiction, I guess. I was also not only captivated with, with aviary birds, but also uh, captivated by birds in, in the field. And thanks to my mum and dad, who gave me a pair of binoculars and a field guide for my eighth birthday, uh, I was a, a mad bird watcher from a very early age. And um, I'm not really a ticker at the moment of ticking off how many birds I have seen, but I know it's, it's nearly 500 species, or thereabouts. So it's not a, not a bad effort, considering we've got only 800 species around about in Australia. And then came uh, some opportunities, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, along the way, but essentially I've been involved in ecological research and consulting for the last 15 years. And, uh, and part of that is starting our, our own business in that field uh, back in 2009, where we now employ eight full-time staff in that, in that business as well. And I'm really fortunate in that I've seen some fantastic animals across this country. And um, uh, this is just a, a very, very small snapshot of, of some of the animals that we're fortunate to work with. So um, when we're doing flora and fauna surveys, we, we're, we're basically engaged to, to do population counts of, of either specific species or entire groups of species. And these pictures are all all taken on some of those surveys, including the, the rose crown fruit duck, which has which has long been a favourite. So it started off with canaries, as I talked about. This is um, this is not my first aviary, but one of my very early aviaries. Um, that's a picture taken in the 80s. Um, my first aviary was my cubby house. I I convinced my parents somehow to my sister's disgust of converting our cubby house when I lived in Auburn um, into a bird aviary. It's the best thing that ever happened. Um, at the end of primary school, we moved to the Central Tablelands to a little place called Oberon. I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but it's the coldest place on mainland Australia, in my opinion. But it is the home of a lot of finches. And I think that's where the, the addiction with finches really started. And as we progress, You'll, you'll know that I'm a finch person by just what's in some of our aviaries. But uh, on, our, on our property that we moved to, diamonds, plumheads, double bars and, and red brows were always common. Plumheads not so um, common as the other three, uh, but we still, we still got them in small numbers. And fortunately, with support from my parents, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I bred all but two of the Australian finches before I was 16. Uh, and those two still elude me today, which is red fire tail and beautiful fire tail, but I'm hoping to correct both in the next five years is my, is my plan. Just another couple of pics of, of older aviaries. Um, these are, I, I do excuse the quality. It was um, when Sam asked me to talk, it was trying to uh, find old photographs and take photos of them. I guess we're so fortunate in this age that most of us carry cameras or have, have phones which have cameras, and we just have so many photos of things that's not funny. So to actually find photos of, of, of part of my life has been really quite difficult. Um, 
the the aviary on the um, this top side is one of the first aviaries that we built using hail netting, and I'll talk about hail netting a little bit later. I've already been asked by a couple of people already. So yeah, we'll talk about hail netting a little bit later because it is it is a topic for discussion, especially for finch breeders. It's 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 got its pros and cons, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But this this hail netting aviary, um, it's uh, off memory. It's about four metres tall. Um, around 12 metres long, 8 metres deep, um, and that was, I built that in about, I'm pretty certain it was about 88, so it was when hail netting was, was first becoming available uh, for use in, in agriculture. And if you're involved with finches, you're always involved with zebs in some form or another, and I did have a, a, a fairly major zeb addiction, um, and, and this is a very young me with my eldest daughter, who was probably less than two in that picture, and she is turning 20 this year. So it was a while ago, my fantastic wife down the bottom. This was at the state titles, uh, New South Wales state titles, when they were being held in a hall out near Penrith, and this was the River Enterfish Finch Society team. So Linda and I were, were founding, two of the four founding members of the River Enterfish Finch Society, which I think is now recently folded. Um, and one of many trips to bird shows, that's um, Amy again, a little bit older, but so we were living in, in Wagga at the time. It would be nothing to jump in the car with, with 50 zebs, prep show boxes, and, and that was Lake Macquarie show up at, up at Swansea. So, the things you do. Um, having bred lots of the Australian finches, I got, I got to a point where I wanted a little bit more. And um, I was introduced to a, a man that many of you probably know, um, who's, who's since passed away, but it's Harry Carr. And Harry was a, a very interesting gentleman, um, mad on soft bills and native pigeons, and he started my soft bill addiction. I quickly moved into soft bills um, before I was 20. And it was on this very trip where he showed me some of these aviaries as to open my eyes to what I could actually do. And so this, I'm pretty certain this trip was in the late 80s. This, these poles are telegraph poles to give you some sort, you know, some scale to this photograph. Um, I can't remember the person's uh, name who had this, these aviaries, but it was in the Lower Hunter. Um, he used to take his lawnmower into mow the lawns. He's riding on lawnmower. Um, there, was, there was a big uh, picnic tables in the middle, he'd sit back there and have a few beers and there was a barbecue in one corner. It was all there. In this particular aviary, Regent Bowerbirds, um, lots of fruit pigeons. I just fell in love with soft bills. Then there was this one. This is more than 100 metres long and about 30 metres wide. Again, in the 80s, I think I think it was actually the same gentleman's house as the previous photo. I can't, I can't quite remember. Memory's faded a little bit since the 80s. It's huge. Note, note the absence of any shelter. There are no dedicated shelters. So, with those aviaries in mind, and all these new birds that I couldn't possibly dream that I could keep in aviaries, I took the soft bill plunge, and I still have I still have a really soft spot for lots of soft bills, um, much to my wife's horror sometimes. Um, but these are some of the species we've we've had experience with. Um, Regent bowerbirds, if, if you don't know it, the famous MMI insurance bird, lots of stamps it's been on. Dusky woodswallows are always a favourite. Um, it's a juvenile green wing pigeon or emerald dove. Noisy pitter was definitely a favourite one. I never got to breed, unfortunately, but I'm still going, so there's always a chance. Uh, and, and of course, the, the infamous spurwing plover or, or mast lapwing that attacked the kids at parks. Uh, I used to love this guy, but um, uh, they don't work well in a public facility as of all horses. No, let me rephrase that. They don't work well in a walk-in aviary, so they can get a bit aggressive. So the ecological research and consulting side of what I do takes uh, me and my team all over Australia. We've worked in every Australian state and territory uh, and most of our work is, uh, revolves around threatened species management and 
threatened species monitoring. And I just want to throw a couple of photos in to tease you about all the glamorous locations I've worked at. So this was um, downstream of Tulibuck on the Murray River. Um, we were engaged to do uh, monitoring on the Regent Parrot, which is a, a threatened species now in New South Wales and Victoria. And um, they breed, uh, in, in those two states, they only breed downstream of, of Tule Bay. Um, so um, they are threatened mostly by the loss of their foraging habitat, which is out away from the river red gums. And their, their main, uh, their, their threat at the moment is the, is the loss of that habitat for food production. So it is a major food production area. And um, however, in recent times, the development of the Australian almond industry has meant that region parrots are now starting to fight back and they're actually eating the almond crops rather than losing foraging habitat. So, so regions are having a bit of a comeback in the, in the wild. I've thrown this photo up of a, of a shot of a favourite spot of mine in the Kimberleys. Um, we've been involved with doing um, threatened species surveys in the Kimberleys for a couple of years now, and mostly birds, uh, and particularly Gouldy and Finch. And unfortunately, I can't actually show you the photos of the locations that we survey at, and I can't even tell you where they are, because we, we sign uh, commercial and confidence agreements, and we can't discuss anything about the work we do at all, specifically. I can talk about it generally, but I can't specifically. So I can tell you generally that in the Kimberleys, Gildy and Finches are at the, server, at the locations that we survey at have certainly increased in numbers over the last few years. Lots of juveniles, um, so there's lots of recruitment success. And um, one particular site, which is a favourite of mine, we can have anywhere between five and 600 Gildians in half an hour come to drink. So it's a lot of birds in a very short period of time. But of course, while you're there, you enjoy every other part of Kimberley's. And of course, Kimberley's is really the home of, of lots of grass finches. So it's a terrible place to work. <laughs> Another favourite spot of mine, not so glamorous, but Broken Hill's a pretty interesting city. Um, this is the Barrier Range, just northwest of Broken Hill. Um, it is the site of what is now a the largest wind farm in the southern hemisphere has been approved to be constructed in the barrier ranges, and that's the Silverton wind farm. So if anyone's ever been to Silverton, um, the big ranges to the north is where this development will most probably happen. Um, it is a really wild landscape for, for New South Wales, and as you can see, it's, it's large. Um, these hills in the background are about 35 kilometres away from the point I'm standing on, uh, and everything you can see in that picture is part of what will be this wind farm, which is 600 turbines. Uh, it is actually the largest, strongest wind resource on mainland Australia that the CSIRO know about. Um, it's such a barren landscape. It's been flogged by feral goats. Um, it, um, it, it, it's obviously had, had hard times through, through drought, um, and as you can see, vegetation is, is very sparse. But lots of birds, pretty interesting bird fauna actually. And, and one of my last visits to this site um, as part of some threatened species monitoring that we're doing for the Office of Environment and Heritage on a lizard, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, were crimson chats. This place amazes me with crimson chats. And the last time we were there, um, we do a, a a 500 metre transect as, as one of our surveys. So we walk a 500 metre um, bearing on a compass. And if we didn't see 200 crimson chats in 500 metres, it would be doing it. That was probably an underestimate. So lots and lots of crimson chats. I thought I'd throw this photo in because um, something my dad always reminds me about. And he says, um, he has said in the past that I can't believe people pay you to go camping. So, uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, depends where you look at it, but um, the best thing is, is you spend a lot of time outdoors in this field, uh, and sometimes you're not near the luxuries of a motel uh, or a pub, so out comes the camping trailer and the solar panel to charge the beer fridge and, and the computers uh, and, uh, and some swags to sleep in for the night. 
This was probably one of the most interesting projects I've ever worked on, which is not too far from here, which is the Liverpool military area, the old Holsworthy Army Base. That is one of the most biodiverse landscapes I've ever worked in in the Sydney region. It's 20,000 hectares of vegetation that's never been cleared um, prior to European settlement. So it's amazingly rich in flora and fauna. Um, we did biodiversity surveys here for a three year period and um, it is, even as an active army base, it's the, it's the eastern state side for the, the special forces training, the SAS team. There's live fire, there's live bombs going off all the time. Now, I, I still remember my very first time on this site when the ground's starting to move under your feet from explosions and there's troops running past you while you're doing a bird so survey, holding their machine gun, their camo gear, screaming and yelling at each other. Um, I was crapping myself. It, was, it, was, it wasn't nice. I was nearly going home within the first couple of days. By about the third or fourth trip, we were told that our presence was going to be incorporated into one of their exercises. And I still remember being held down on the ground with a hood over my head and a guy standing on me to hold me down after he removed me from my car. It, 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 it was actually really, really terrifying. Um, lots of threatened species on this site. Just about every threatened species of of plant and animal, no animal known from the Sydney region is on the Holdsworthy Army Base. It's just fantastic. One of the most memorable moments was actually at this campsite on our very last survey trip. Uh, we used to spend three weeks at a time in, in, in this country. Um, camping one night, there were three Black Hawk helicopters came down under with no lights, all under night vision, and they landed probably 50 metres from us. It was, it was crazy. Um, so working, working away always has these challenges of, of how you manage things. I just like this photo because it, it shows the, the vastness of, of you know, the reality of what we do. Yes, we, we do flora and fauna surveys, but we've also got data entry and recording, which is on computer these days. And so we're actually got this computer set up, hooked up to a satellite phone, to try and get our data uploaded into a government database. So, a new species. I have been so very lucky, and, and it is lucky, that I think it's almost any ecologist's dream that they're involved in identifying new species, and that happened to me um, three years ago, uh, where we had a new species of reptile in New South Wales. The species was uh, known um, was the particular animals were known, but it was always thought they were different. That they were another species of lizard. So our work actually identified that they were quite different from what everyone thought they were, and our DNA analysis proved that they were quite different. Um, in fact, they were at least six and a half million years separated in time from the the dragon. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so this is me with a, an eight metre fishing pole with a, um, a little piece of, of fishing line on the end made into a noose, trying to catch one of these lizards. And this is the lizard in my hand. It's, it's, uh, it's an adult, this is an adult male, so it's full size. So head there, you just see the tail poking out. So it's not very large. So this is the male. So this is the barrier range dragon now. It was formerly known as the Tawny Rock Dragon, which is quite common in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. Um, the Barrier Range Dragon is very different, even just visually. And we always had this gut feeling when we first found this species on the site. Um, the, the bright orange head is the male's, well, it's, it's a nuptial plumage. It's, the, it's their breeding plumage. The male develops the bright orange head to stand out to the females. He will sit up on a rock, bob his head around, wave his arms, hey, come over here, here I am, mate with me. Um, and, but with the tawny rock dragon from the Flinders, um, they, this black striping is virtually absent on the throat, and in many instances, the throat itself is, is yellow rather than orange. So, we all, so when we first found this site, um, and, and I should add that this particular species is known from only two areas in New South Wales. 
Um, it is known at a site north of Broken Hill on, on private property and is known from Manawiji National Park, which is about 130 kilometres northeast of Broken Hill. Only two places in the world, and we're looking at a population estimate of probably only about a thousand animals. That's it. That's all we have. So I think that's pretty cool. I didn't put a picture in the, of the female because, as with most birds, the female's pretty boring. I'm sorry. She's the, she's the same size. She's brown. That's it. Right, On the Perch. Some of you may or may not have heard of, heard of On the Perch. Um, on the Perch, and I, I guess from a bird keeper's perspective, there's always been a point, and I'm sure every, every one of you will, won't deny this. There's a point in our lives where we thought, wouldn't it be great to have our own bird park? I don't think anyone will deny that at all. Um, and it's always been a dream of mine. You know, I've, I've, I've been lucky in that I always got dragged around zoos when I was a kid, always fascinated. Um, having bred a lot of softbills and native pigeons, I was, I was exposed to um, actually working with people in zoos over many years and in some instances supplying animals to, to zoos. Um, we, were, we were very fortunate in that, um, I don't know if anyone ever made it to Pearl Coast Zoo in Broome, when it was open, um, a very, uh, very eccentric British lord by the name of Lord McAlpine thought he was so much money, what he wanted to do was open a zoo in Australia. So that's what he did. And it was a pretty good establishment actually, just behind Cable Beach in Broome. We, Monday night when we spoke at the Wollongong Finch Club, I was just trying to remember the exact year, but if anyone can remember the, the year of the, of the famous pilots dispute, when domestic air travel got shut down in Australia because pilots were complaining about wages. Um, I think it was, I think it was 91, uh, 90 or 91, anyway. Um, travel to the Kimberleys at that time was, was not getting your camper van and caravan and go, it was fly to Broome. You couldn't even fly to Kununurra at that stage. It was flights from, from Sydney to Broome or Perth to Broome. And so when the pilots dispute happened, Broome collapsed because of no tourists. Um, so Pearl Coast Zoo uh, was one of those victims of, of the pilots dispute. And it was only the fact that I had had some transactions with the zoo a, a couple of months before that their senior keeper contacted me and said, we've got all these birds, what do you want to do with them? You, you want them? Yes, yes, I'll have them. I'll take them if I have to. Um, one of, the, one of the most exciting things I got from that bird collection was, and one of the most favourite was uh, redback kingfishers. And, um, and to this day, I believe that I'm still am the only private aviculturist that's bred redback kingfishers in captivity. I, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, and, and the species is very rarely bred by, by zoos. It is a, a favourite of mine and one that I will, um, I will get again. So on the perch um, is, is, a, is a privately run uh, bird park on the south coast. Um, it steps away from the traditional zoo model in that um, most of our exhibits are, are walk-in aviaries. It's, um, um, it's, not, it's not banks and banks of aviaries as, as some places have been in the past. Um, so um, but we'll run through that in a second. So our objectives are avian education, conservation, and assisting in rehabilitation. So we, just by the fact that we are a, a place that's open to the public, people pick up uh, injured birds that hit one in the car, or you know, there's an orphan bird on the ground, or well, what they assume is an orphan bird on the ground, pick it up, they need to take it to somebody. So we, we, end, up being, we end up being that place. But fortunately, we've got two great wildlife caring groups that we pass those animals on to, simply because it can be such a drain on our own resources. And we are on the Sapphire Coast. If any, someone, Tartra and, and Barry? Yeah. Barry. Barry visited us last month. Um, so it is not too far south of Sydney, but we're very close to the Victorian border. Um, 
if you ever thought of opening a bird park before, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. Probably just one. Don't. <laughs> um, it's difficult. It is very difficult. Um, so we'd had this idea floating around in my head, my wife and I, for a few years, and we never really found the right place to do it. We, we were driving to Tarthra one day, because we live in a, a little place called Kalaroo, which is only five minutes from Tarthra, and this nursery here had been in operation for 35 years. Uh, the business had closed down, the site was, became available. And we, I think she was going to Tarthra to get a couple of bottles of wine, she come back running through the front door, yelling and screaming that this place was available. So that was about a year and a half ago now. This department, okay, actually, can I just say, does anyone work for Department of Primary Industries? <laughs> no? Oh, you do? You used to. You still, okay, the used to is okay. You still do? Okay, I'll be careful. <laughs> do, you, do you work in... in oh, I just do it. Enable, enable health, health okay, alright, that's alright then. You guys are probably good. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me just say that if you've ever had, if, if for those, for those um, finch keepers that have a, an animal keeper's um, licence with, with Office of Environment and Heritage, and you think it's painful to deal with that department sometimes, and fill out your record books, and you know, you've got it so easy you really have it easy compared to some of the things that we had to jump through to just be able to open. The process is several phases. Firstly, you fill out what is um, an application for approval to construct an animal facility, it's enclosure or facility. When we first looked at the form, it was only about six pages long, and we thought, oh, this won't be so bad to fill out. We'll just fill out a few things send it in with our application form. Then we downloaded the form and started to realise the level of information that was needed for the form. We have four, four main exhibits at On The Perch currently, plus our quarantine facilities, and our off-exhibit facilities, our treatment room, our food storage areas, and our application ended up being just on 500 pages long. It took nearly three months for me to write, um, it also needed to include archi archi architectural plant dr drawings of the aviaries, engineer, full engineer's designs, species lists of what was going in each aviary, including quantity, full landscaping design. Then, once we do did all that, we then had to justify all those decisions based on species, landscaping, and, oh sorry, we had to provide full, full captive husbandry requirements, you know, diet, water, um, preventative health, all that sort of thing, for each exhibit. So it gets, it gets complicated. There were plenty of times where I said to myself, this is too hard, I can't do this anymore. But, but thankfully, my wife really pushed me and um, kept, kept feeding me red wine, <laughs> so keep going. You've come this far, you've got to keep going. So we did. The application form says your application will be assessed in six weeks. That's fair enough, six weeks, that's great. That'll be good. It's never, never takes six weeks. From when? Yeah. Well, you assume from when they receive it, wouldn't you? So here's the process. They receive it, then they review it to see if it's adequate. That process takes four weeks. Then they get back to you and say, either your application is, is adequate, we can now assess it, or we will need some extra information before we can assess it. So we had a letter back saying, you need to supply some extra information. So that we did. We had to justify why we were using dead branches in cages, in our, in our aviaries for perching. I'm not going to try and explain that, but we had to justify that. It, but anyway, it, it, the justification was made by simply going to other zoos and taking photographs of dead ranches used for perches. And they accepted that as an adequate justification. 
So anyway, once uh, that was sorted, and they came back again and said, um, you're, you're using hail netting for your ovaries. And we'll talk about hail netting again, but you need to justify why you can use hail netting instead of conventional wire. So that we did. So anyway, from the time we submitted the initial application to the time that we received um, our approval to construct our facility, that was about three months. Three, yeah, but just over three months. So it wasn't so bad. Then, we, we, so we've got our permission to construct. Once you construct, then you have to actually have permission to put birds in the exhibits. So for two days, an inspector came out uh, and reviewed our application against our exhibits to see if they were exactly the same. They had to be exactly the same. There was no opportunity for deviation. And, and you guys are looking at me going, <laughs> um, when you're already an established zoo, that process, um, the process is similar, but it doesn't have the inspection side. You send in photographs to provide evidence that you've done it the same as what you said you would in your application. But as a new exhibitor, um, with this zoo license, we had to go through the hoops. So, apart from all that painful stuff, let's talk about some of our exhibits. Um, the first exhibit is our, is our Asian, uh, essentially our Asian uh, exhibit. Our favourites are the Mandarin ducks. Um, don't know if anyone's had experience with Mandarin ducks before, but um, they don't look like this all the time. I guess that's probably the, the biggest misconception. Um, the male has that nuptial plumage, so they start to colour up about April and they hold, hold that plumage pretty much till about the end of October. Um, and for the, for the rest of the time, pretty much looks like the female. The only difference, there's a little slight difference in plumage, but also the leg colour is a bit different as well. So you can see by our species list, uh, there's a few finches, red face parodies, uh, spice, jarvis, um, goldfinches, goldfinches. European goldfinches in our Asian aviary. They're there because European goldfinches occur right across the European continent, right through into West China. Uh, and they are there because we were donated some breeding pairs from a breeder, um, which we will put in our future UK exhibit. So, but for somewhere for them to go initially, they do fit in our Asian exhibit. One of the conditions of our zoo license is that our Exhibits need to be biogeographically correct. So they need to be themed, uh, they need to have interpretive signs like any other, any other zoo, um, and they need to uh, be educational. Um, what other finches do we have in there? Sorry? Yeah, so we've got plenty of doves. You can, you can, here's my soft bill side coming out of me. Um, so bleeding hearts, uh, New Guinea ground doves, Spotted turtle doves, we, we cop, cop a little bit of criticism over spotted turtle doves, particularly when a bird breeder comes in and says, what do you have spotted turtle doves for? Um, they're a great, great little bird that is very underrated. Um, so I, I like them, and it's my place, I'll have what I want. <laughs> so, um, a few parrots, plum-headed parrot and Indian ringneck. Um, oh, chestnut-breasted mannequins, have those in there as well. Red-faced parrot finches, I need to tell you a story about those. Um, we, did, we did have red-faced parrot finches in this aviary, uh, and they still, we still have the interpretive sign in the aviary, but red-faced parrot finches can become very tame very quickly. And as visitors arrive at our, um, at our entry area, they have the opportunity to buy little tubs of mealworms. And <laughs> there's some laughter here already. You go into an aviary with a tub of mealworms with red-faced parrot finches and they soon get to know that the little plastic container that we sell our mealworms in has, has food in it. And, and they become very quickly leaping all over everyone that walks in the aviary. We lost a couple of red-faced parrot finches um, that way. Um, and in fact, um, some of them made their way out the double out because they were sitting on people still and the people didn't realise. So we've also had an instance where 
they've been right under someone's feet and, and a bird's been accidentally trodden on. So we've removed the red face parrot finches from that exhibit um, because they've become so um, accustomed to, to people um, that, that they're at risk. Um, so we're trying to de trying to get them not used to being people in the off exhibit area, but I don't think I'll put them back. I think it's too it's too risky. But everyone loved them. The Javas are a little bit like that too. Um, we've got about 30 Javas in this aviary and we have some people that um, some some people they just gravitate to. You know, I saw a, I saw a picture recently of of a lady that had eight Javas sitting on it. So so this is the aviary um, being built. As I said, it was an old nursery. It was a nursery for 35 years, and with the nursery came all this infrastructure. Part of it was the the paved paths. So we tried to design our exhibits around what we already had to minimise our, our costs. Um, so this um, this particular aviary had a had a, um, a paved path. Um, the poles uh, they're not put in position yet. They're not bent, uh, as this would suggest. But these these holes, all these um, poles and holes are engineer designed. The poles extend into the ground 1.3 metres, um, which is very deep. And they um, essentially have two concrete collars, top and bottom, and dry packed um, clay around the posts themselves. So they're pretty sturdy. Um, the airlocks, <laughs> the airlocks just being built here, the double airlock system. So this is this is looking from another angle as as the the walls solid walls are heading in to stop the south, southerly breeze. Um, the the centre area was already planted. It was already a uh, a mound that had a couple of little ponds in the back and this all this dianella growing around the side here. You can just see the shelter forming in the back there. This particular aviary is 12 metres, what's 12 metres one way, 10 the other, and about four and a half to five high, depending on where you measure it. And this is basically finished, uh, entry, entry through the double doors and, and into the exhibit. Palm netting used for the wire, which we'll talk about later, I still haven't forgotten. So that's looking from inside the exhibit now as, as plants are starting to grow. The, uh, the, the centre clump, we've, we've established some larger trees on there, uh, and the new addition is this uh, grassed area at the back. We found the ducks weren't coping too well with the leaf litter uh, and the paved paths, so we've put in a nice lawn area. And it's funny how the finches use that. Um, I've never had lawn in an aviary before, and I, I don't know if any of you do, but the finches spend a lot of time on the lawn. Uh, they, they love it. So a couple of pics of the occupants. Uh, silver eye up in the top left and buff banded rail uh, down the bottom. And, and one of my favourite doubles of all time, the bleeding hearts. It's amazing with the bleeding heart doves. Just about every child that comes in and walks into that exhibit races back out and says, you've got an injured bird in there. And when we first opened, it was like, oh, wow, we better go and check it out. Oh, tell the story. And now when it's, in, it's the bleeding heart. It, it, does it, is it white and it looks like it's been stabbed? Yes. So it's, it's great. Bleeding hearts are incredible. If, if anyone doesn't know the background of bleeding hearts, you know, um, native to the, to the Luzon Island in the Philippines. So we're talking an island the size of Tasmania that has 50 million people on it. Think about that. And of course, for the bleeding heart dove, apparently it's great to eat. So the bush meat trade is, is, is a big reason, but habitat loss is by far the greatest. And they're now critically endangered on their native, in their native country. The Kimberley Avery, this is, I know you all guys all like this one. The Kimberley Avery was, was an idea that, I, I, it was an Avery I had to have, I guess, being a Finch person. Not too many occupants. 
Um, so we keep red, black and yellow headed buildings. We've got a, a great colony of mast finches in there. It's normal mast. And uh, a recent arrival with some pictorellas. Um, and some painted finches and some king quail running around on the floor. And I don't know if anyone knows this, but king quail are officially termed Chinese blue quail, according to the Handbook of the Birds of the World. I hadn't heard that name before. So this is the start of our Kimberley exhibit. Um, the, the, the shed structure itself was already there as the initial nursery retail part of the business. And when I first saw this space, I knew that it could be used because one of our survey sites is actually a, at a homestead with corrugated iron walls. And when I first saw Gouldians in the wild, it was at a, tap, a, a dripping tap with the corrugated iron in the background. And I thought, yeah, this, this fits well, I can, I can use this space. So um, essentially, um, this paved path was already here, windows and iron was in position. All we had to do was build these, these two walls. So this is, um, this is about eight metres across uh, and about 10 metres back this way. So a big glass window in the front. And that's the, that's the end product. And this is in our cafe area where you can sit and have coffee and, and watch the finches. Um, one, one question I was asked at Wollongong on Monday night was about the glass. How do the birds find the glass? And most of the times the birds avoid the glass. And I think it's because there's people standing outside glaring in at them. We have had a couple of occasions where you'll, you'll hear a flutter and you'll, and you'll see the white dust where someone has collided with the glass. We haven't had a fatality from it. Um, and the way that the perching generally works in here, we've got this, we've got a, a dead branch here, and one here, and one over the back. So they're flying in a, in a triangle shape. And I think partially that helps us. The other, the other thing that probably helps us is, is one of our designs to meet our zoo license conditions. One of those conditions was the birds have to have areas where they can escape being looked at by people. So they have to be able to get away. And, and we've done it in our Kimberley Avery by extending this branch all the way to the roof. And just above the window is, is our, uh, are all our nest boxes. And there is a full length dowel that runs across the top of the window as well. So the birds can sit there and not be seen. And I think what happens generally is the birds fly from these perches and they fly straight upwards. There's, there's no need for them to, to look out the window and be on. So at this point in time, I'm still leaving this glass because it looks fantastic. And, and, the, and the risk to the birds hasn't been great. You know, if, if I thought that there was an animal welfare issue, I'd be doing something about it, but at this stage it's working really good. Um, I don't, but I should explain that the glass window is not fully glass. So it's only this centre panel that's glass. These two panels on the end are 6mm steel wire. So yeah, you can hear everything really well. Just an example of one of our interpretive signs. Um, as part of the zoo licence process, I said we needed to have interpretive signs to, to promote the education of of the, all the animals that we put on display. Every single interpretive sign had to be approved by the Department of Primary Industries. We had to, well, before they got printed, um, as part of our application, they had to approve the text on every single one. All right, our inland Australian Avery. This is the Avery where we'll talk about hail netting. Um, This aviary is 30 metres by 30 metres, roughly. Um, it is only 2.4 metres high. And I'll, I'll show you the structure in a minute, but you can see the species list. Um, a few finches, a few parrots. It's a fairly, it's a fairly mixed exhibit. And of course, a few softbills, um, bushstone curlew, yellow-tufted honeyeater, 
um, splendid fairy wren, which is pictured. This is the, the black bat subspecies uh, Melanotus from Western New South Wales. Um, bush sebs, bush budgies, and a few few near famous. Oh, and of course the purple crown lorikeets, in good value. So this is the the aviary as we started. Um, this structure is made out of 40 mil gal water pipe, and it was an existing structure on the site. It was the original shade house for the nursery, so it was covered in shade cloth. Had a full irrigation system that um, has a water license to extract from this 28 million litre dam just sitting on the other side, um, and um, it, when I first saw it. It's going to make a perfect aviary. The other, the other thing we looked at with this site is the gravel. Um, and I'll make some comments about the gravel when we get to the African exhibit, but generally the gravel is a great, great foundation for, I believe, for any, any finch or soft bill aviary. It heats up so well, and, and in my experience, the birds spend a lot of time on the gravel. And in some instances, you know, on a 40 degree day, all my African finches, all my African wax wheels, will be sitting on the gravel, just loving it. So what we did, we pulled the shade cloth off this um, um, structure. I won't call it an aviary yet, I shouldn't. Um, and we started to landscape. And that's the general theme that I do with any of my aviaries, is I landscape first, build later. So if I'm thinking about aviaries in the future, I plant them now. It's a pain in the backside when you're building, but you really reap the rewards when you're um, when you've got you've built your aviary and all of a sudden you, all your plants are looking great. You might lose a few accidentally along the way with a piece of machinery, or or they're in the wrong place and you've had to rip them out. But overall, it works well. Um, so a few holes in the front here. So we added on our shelters. All our shelters are, um, protect the aviaries from, or, sorry, protect the occupants from our very cold southerlies that blow straight from the Southern Ocean and Antarctica all the way to Tathra uh, in winter time. Uh, we're a fairly mild climate. Our, our daytime temperatures generally don't exceed about 15 degrees in winter. So, um, so it is really important for us to, to have nice, warm, draft-free areas for our birds. This is our rat wall going in, and we've put rat walls in all our aviaries. So our rat wall consists of um, iron that extends uh, 30 centimetres below ground level, and uh, anywhere from a metre to 1.3 metres above ground level. This particular one was a nightmare because it was an existing um, structure. We couldn't get the machine around it to actually dig it. So one of my staff, for a week with a mannequin and a crowbar, uh, it was actually 10 days, went up, did 120 metres of this trench. He, he didn't thank me for it at the time, but in reflecting, he said it was a, it was a really, really good time. He, goes, well, he, he, said, he said, I wouldn't do it again, but it, it was good. So this is, um, so you can see the transition now of planting to, to um, when we're, even before we've got netting on. Um, we've, we've done all our path work already while we can still get machines in um, before we've enclosed it. So we've done as much as we can with mechanical equipment. Power netting going on. That's why wife up the ladder, she loves harmony. I'll tell you why shortly. Here it is, harmony. There's a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion in the past about the use of harmony, whether you should use it or shouldn't use it. And there's a few, I think there's a few golden rules you should think about before you make a decision. If you have overhanging vegetation, don't ever use it because it will not, will not cope with large quantities of leaf litter falling on the roof. Uh, it'll start to rot um, with that 
leaflet is sitting on top. Uh, and of course, if you lose a branch off the top, it will just go straight through it. You cut this stuff with a pair of scissors. You know, it's, it's not robust for that sort of treatment. You can get a hail netting now that is a 19 millimeter mesh, so out of the range of, of all of our finches, uh, they'll slide straight through that. Um, but it has a stainless steel insert. So if you're doing a parrot aviary, um, or an aviary that is much larger or has overhang veg, uh, that would actually work well, but it is quite expensive. We tried, we tried two different hail nettings um, in, this, in what is what we call stage one. Um, we used a product from Haverford, which is, Haverford is a company based in Mascot. Um, the, the mesh that we've used is their 10 millimeter uh, mesh, and it comes in a 10 meter wide strip. So it's, if you're talking about Avery's, it's, it's big Avery's, it covers ground quickly. It weighs only 150 grams per square meter. So it doesn't need much to hold it up. And in fact, the best thing you can do with hail netting is not try and hold it down. It needs to be flexible to move with the wind. So you only fix it on your bottom points. And for us, we fix on our, we fix on our rat wall rail, then we screw the rat wall over the top to create a nice finish. The top rail and right across the top of this 30 by 30 meter aviary is not fixed except at a junction where it meets the um, African exhibit. And it will move 30 centimetres on a windy day, up and down. It needs to have that flexibility. If, it, if you tie it down, it creates a wear point and the nylon will just break. And then you've got an escape point. And if you have soft bills, they will find the hole. Will the flexibility of the wind, will that scare the birds at all? Doesn't seem to worry anymore, no. Not at all. Yes, so my next disclaimer. If you have rats, you've got to have a tall rat wall. So I've seen it I've seen I've seen rat walls done differently depending on the the objectives of the aviary. I always use a corrugated iron rat wall to simply slow down mice. But I have seen how mesh used where their rat wall has essentially been six mil vermin wire and then they've done hail netting. But for me, the rat can just climb up the six mil vermin and then straight through the top. Um, I've also seen it set up where it goes right to the ground and, and then hot wire. You know, and uh, 10 lines of hot wire. But if you're only hot wiring that far, we all know a rat can jump further than that. So I guess what I can tell you is my experience. This particular product, so this isn't the Haverford one. This is from Netpro um, in Stanthorpe in southern Queensland. It's an eight millimetre mesh size, but if you look, if you look closely, so there's the eight millimetre diamond, there's all these filaments in between. So the, the mesh size is only about four millimetres. And what it does, it gives a beautiful shading effect over the aviary. It's supposed to be eight and a half metres wide, but it's actually so difficult to stretch, best we could get was six metres out of this one. So the, the Haverford one is 10 metres wide. Um, overhanging veg, um, oh price, price. We all know how the bird wire is. Um, Hail netting. The, the Haverford one that's 10 metres wide, uh, by one lineal metre in width, is $15. So start to add that up over an aviary, and especially when you don't need much to hold it up, it becomes a, it becomes a really viable option. The thing I like about hail netting is because I keep lots of pigeons and doves, is that when they get spooked, and they fly, and they, and they look to, they'll look to a tree well beyond the boundaries of, of the aviary, so that's where they're going to perch to. They hit the nail, palm and netting, bounce off, land on the ground, and they sit there and go on, okay, and just hop up. Now if that was a wire wall, they may not hop up. Um, I'm often asked about, about raptors, um, particularly goshawks and things that run across the top of roofs of aviaries. 
Um, we have peacocks run across the roof of our aviary. You can't even see where they've been. So, and I guess if you do have a raptor run across the top of the aviary and stir your birds up, it's hitting the mesh netting and, and they're not hurting themselves anyway. So I, I, I love hail netting. I think it's a, it's a really practical option for aviaries um, and, um, and, and it's a cheap option but you've just got to use it wisely. So this is the Inland Australian Avery just before, um, not long before inspection. Um, so balustrading's put up. Uh, we stole the balustrading idea from a motorsport event. Um, this is actually just star pickings with PVC tube over the top, holes drilled, and that's six millimetre rope. Really cheap option. Keeps people on the path and the whole point of this exhibit is for people to be able to walk into it but also for the birds to be able to escape where the people are and, and keeping even even the white space in the balustrade and little kids still don't wander far before mum and dad pick them up. Just a picture of the airlocks uh, before and after. These door systems are on um, we use a self-closing uh, hinge, um, so the doors are quite heavy manufactured. They weigh around 45 kilos with the cladding on it. Um, we didn't initially have magnets on the doors because the self-closing hinge actually come, you know, held the door back in position. But we found that once we put once we put the steel panel on the bottom, it was a wind catching point and the wind would just blow the door open. And that was discovered one day when I walked out and both doors of the airlock were open. Thankfully, we hadn't lost anything. So now, sitting up the top here is a little, a little magnet that has a 60 kilo um, rating, holds the door closed, but still allows people to push the door open. So this is uh, still before we have birds in. Uh, vegetation is still pretty scant. We did, um, we did put quite a few PVC tubes up just to fill with brush uh, in the interim, but we don't do too much of that these days. So this is the Avery now. Um, took a photo uh, Monday morning before we got the car to drive up. Uh, and you can see the vegetation's really started to grow. It is, it is a foggy morning, so don't adjust your eyes. Uh, in the background, um, but there are I think I think we're at 17 species in this exhibit and about 250 birds. Just some pics of of some of my favourites: uh, yellow tufted honey eater, uh, which we fledged um, two chicks this season. Um, and remembering we opened September 4th, so um, our final inspection from the Department of Primary Industries was only two weeks before we opened. So it was a mad rush to get birds settled before we opened. Um, I thought it would be a major disruption to our breeding season because about 50% of the birds were from our own private collection. Um, the others were donations from uh, private breeders, uh, and from other zoos and wildlife parks. So I, I had expected that year one, given that we were moving birds in the end of August, was probably going to be a bit of a write-off. But it actually worked the other way. Um, I think the change was great for some. Yellow tufted honey eater I've been trying to breed for three years. Fellow bird keepers was exposed to people having birds stolen. And so being, being a public facility, I was very mindful that some of the birds I had at home were never going to go on display. Um, and ultimately that's the, th that's the theme throughout the entire park. It's not about having the, the rarest, most expensive bird on display. It's about exposing people to the joys of birds with reasonably common um, species that are readily accessible. And I, I, can, I can be fairly confident that on at least two occasions I've been scoped out by people that I'm sure were, were looking to, to make some acquisitions. They were pretty dodgy characters. They were in and out pretty quickly. 
So, you know, whilst we have full security system up still, uh, lots of cameras that I can sit here and look on my phone at this time of night still. Um, the fact of the matter is there's nothing too expensive on display. And so we, we're, we're reducing our risk of being a target. The most common popular question from bird keepers when they come to our place, how, how do you keep lovebirds with finches? And I first, I've tried it before and failed miserably. When I was a kid, I still remember the carnage. I first saw an exhibit at Adelaide Zoo, their African savannah, and they had, a, they had about 30 or 40 um, black mice with a whole colony of ruddies, orange breasts, cordons, green singers. And I sat there and watched them, and there was no interaction at all between the lovebirds and the finches. And I was like, well, maybe it's just the size of the aviary. When I've tried it at home, it's only been in a smaller smaller aviary. So, so we tried it, and it's worked beautifully. There hasn't been a single incident between the two. Now, the African aviary is around about 15 metres by 8 metres and has lots of ample perching opportunities. The finches definitely steer clear of the lovebirds. There is no, you know, and if a lovebird lands near a finch, the first thing the finch does is, is off. So they still all have their toes and they still all have their legs. So this is, um, so this is the aviary going up. So it is, it is, it is sited in the corner of the inland Australian Avery. Finished product. This is the PVC tubes that I was talking about. Um, it's, it's funny, you know, you sit brush out in the open and most of our breeding has actually been out in the tubes in the open. Birds getting wet, green singers, cordons, cutthroats. Um, one thing that's probably worked really well in here is our use of termites. Being on the south coast, we have ample supplies of termites. Uh, in fact, we have 30 termite mounds within a, a minute walk of our aviaries. It's pretty easy. It's, it's, why wouldn't I use them? You know, and to, to put it into context, I've got one pair of cordons that have uh, just fledged their fourth nest in September because of because of white ants. I do disclose to everyone I sell birds to that I use termites. Um, there's been some people say that you know if you take birds off termites, I'll never breed again. But you know, I don't know whether that's true or not. But I always I always tell everyone how I do things, so there's no secrets with me. This is the one we're currently building. Um, so we've been open six months as of last Friday, and we've had um, nearly 6,000 people through the Avery since we've opened, which is about double what we'd expected in our, in our financial analysis. So it's been, um, it's been going really well. So uh, this particular exhibit was always one that, that I wanted to do before we opened, but we just ran out of money. Um, it was as simple as that. So, now that we're six months in and, and decided that it's probably going to go okay, we're going to keep we're going to keep going. We've actually got 20 hectares. Not that my wife will let me fill that with bird aviaries, and not that I would ever want to do that. Probably, um, we've got space, which is which is good. That's the proposed list of occupants, and um, and I I was very I was very savvy in combining this trip with collecting some of these birds um, while I was here. Um, and we had a, a fantastic donation of our colony of white brow woods flies from Blackbutt Reserve up at Newcastle. Uh, and if you've never been to Blackbutt Reserve, it actually blew me away when I went there today. It's a fantastic facility that is uh, run by the Newcastle Council and, and there's no entry charge. It's, it's great and lots of birds. Um, so they donated a, a, a colony of white brow woods flies uh, to us. Uh, there will be some finches. Um, our diamonds are in quarantine now that we recently acquired. 
I've always loved diamonds when I first saw them on our, you know, on our place in the Central Tablelands and um, there was always going to be a spot for them. So this is the Avery. Um, we, we closed the facility down for three days about three weeks ago to put these poles in. Um, so it is 30 metres long, it's 20 metres the other way. Uh, it's an L-shaped exhibit. And, and one side of the, so this particular side is about 14 metres and this particular side is about 8 metres. Uh, so you're walking from this direction, there's the Asian exhibit in the background and the Inland Australian, the Africans just over the back. Um, so 38 poles and uh, all 1.4 metres into the ground, 1.3 metres into the ground. Uh, it took us three days, three of us to put those in with the help of a bobcat. A little bit on our food, um, because it would be amiss of me not to mention uh, some of our corporate arrangements. And being in a community like the Burger Valley, uh, which is famous for burger cheese, which I'm sure you've all heard about, um, we've got some really great support from, from uh, corporate sponsors. We use about 30 kilos of fruit and vegetables a week, and they're all supplied to us free of charge from Woolworths, which is fantastic. Uh, Beaker cheese also supply all our cheese for the birds. Uh, we use about 10 kilo of cheese a week in our in our meat mix. The birds get red wine as well, that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. Um, so our meat mix has a, has, is a, if anyone wants the recipe, I can supply it later, but uh, the meat mix is an interesting mix because I, I, I've always used it for my soft bills, but most finches love it. It's kangaroo mints, mixed with grated cheese, mixed with mashed boiled egg, mixed with turkey crumbles, and wombaroo insectivore mix. Is that all but Holly? Yeah? Um, Finches love it, they really do. We are supplied free goods and services or uh, ongoing support with, with all sorts of different things. So it's, it's, it's been a, a fantastic journey with the help of, of plenty of others. And you'll all recognise that photo because I was very proud to feature on the front cover uh, and in a couple of other places, I think, in the, in the calendar for the Finch Society. So that's that's about it. So any any questions? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, I didn't mention that, did I? Um, it's funny because so we have Indian ringnecks and plum-headed parrots in in Avery with harm netting. They don't touch it. We have in the inland Australian, well, in, in the African exhibit. I have used six mil steel wire on the walls, but the ceiling is still pale netting with lovebirds. Don't go anywhere near it. In the inland Australian Avery, the parrots we're running are Regents, Superbs and Princess. I've seen the Superbs have a play with it, but they're not, they're not chewing it. Um, I have a friend with Eclectus who said, he sat a piece in there one day to see what they do and they destroyed it in seconds. But I think that's a different context because if you go to the, the large Avery at Melbourne Zoo, they've had collectors flying around everywhere and they've used nylon netting. So I think it all depends on the size of the Avery, what the birds actually have to do because in his instance, the birds thought it was something to chew on. We don't have any of our perches Adjoined, and, and with hail netting, you can't you can't just slip a dowel perch in, and you wouldn't because of the additional weight once the bird's perched on. So all our perches are away from the netting. Um, so I think it's just something that people have to try. And I, I know I know people with rosellas. Um, I'm not sure if they're a big chewer, um, but I wouldn't do a cockatoo over here. Um, it's worth exploring. I don't know how you do it without having a loss. I guess you could do it 
you could do a small, see the thing, if you did a small, if you, if you made a smaller cage, I think they would chew it because they're bored, there's nothing for them to do. But in our areas, there's plenty of space, plenty of, plenty of branches. We, we put in freshly cut browse branches each day uh, for the birds to, to either forage in or take nectar from flowers or to chew, uh, being the case of the parrots. They don't do anything else. It is kangaroo mince, grated cheese, mashed boiled egg, turkey crumbles, and Wombaroo insectivore. And I can, I'll leave the recipe with Sam, and he can, and if anyone wants it, they can get it off him. Put it in the magazine. Yeah, put it in the magazine. We'll put it in the magazine. I don't mind sharing that. How long do you leave it in there? Yeah, look, I, I only put it in, it only goes in the morning. I shouldn't say I, it's one of our keepers, like Holly, puts it in the morning. Um, it doesn't come out till the next morning. We don't have a, we don't have a blowfly. We don't have blowflies on the far south coast. We only have little bushflies. So I don't, if you have blowflies in Sydney, it might go off a lot quicker. Any other questions? Thank Steve for the trip and terrific talk too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the dog comments too that will um, I'll, I'll, I'll help you finish this evening. Here's one. Who asked me?